Hi, Dr. Kat Fleece here from Central New Mexico Community College. In this video E of the endocrine system, we're going to focus on how hormones are secreted, but especially on the mechanisms of action for these hormones. What, in other words, what exactly happens to a cell when a hormone binds to it? If we first take a look at their methods of secretion, then we see that some hormones are secreted just by means of exocytosis, and that form of secretion we refer to as vesicular. So most of the protein and peptide-based hormones are going to go through the process of exocytosis, and often this allows for the storage um, of the hormones in the vesicles. On the other hand, steroids are mostly released as they're being synthesized, so they cannot easily be stored, and we refer to this method of secretion as non-vesicular, meaning no vesicles are formed. So when hormones bind to their receptors, what exactly happens to our target cell? Remember when you learned about the impact of a neurotransmitter binding to its receptor on a postsynaptic membrane in the nervous system. You learn in great detail how that all works. Well, some neurotransmitters do something similar as the hormones, and they depend on a second messenger system. But um, in addition to that, hormones can also directly activate genes, and of course, that's going to be our steroids that are capable of doing that because they can easily pass through the cell membrane and the nuclear envelope. So these are your two major mechanisms for hormones, while neurotransmitters can also depend on second, the second messenger system. So hormones that are lipid-soluble are going to be able to cross the cell membrane and cross the nuclear envelope and reach the DNA and in that way succeed in binding to the DNA to where the hormone can directly impact the activation or inactivation of a particular gene. Lipid-soluble hormones you know by now are the steroids, but also thyroid hormone succeeds in crossing the cell membrane and the nuclear envelope, even though it's an amine, um, but it has a chemical modification which includes benzene rings that have iodine associated with them, and that makes thyroid hormone actually lipid-soluble as well. So what we'll see is that these lipid-soluble hormones, they're going to find a receptor on the inside of the cell. Remember, intra means inside of the cell, so we refer to it as an intracellular receptor. Direct gene activation is a, a pretty easy process to understand. So up here we have our capillary, near the top of the picture here, within it either a steroid or thyroid hormone that can easily leave the capillary and then cross the cell membrane, because we're dealing with a lipid-soluble hormone, Inside of our cell, in the cytoplasm, there is a receptor specific for this hormone that will bind to the hormone. So now we have formed a receptor hormone complex. This receptor hormone complex can easily cross the nuclear envelope. Remember, we're dealing with a lipid-soluble hormone, particularly through the nuclear pores. And once inside of the nucleus, the complex will bind to a particular spot on the DNA. Remember, the DNA is made up of many, many uh, base pairs that literally, and the particular sequence of bases is going to code for a particular gene. So depending on where this hormone complex binds, um, a particular gene will become um, impacted because the binding of the complex might trigger transcription to occur. Remember when DNA is converted into mRNA, we refer to the, that process as transcription. And then once we have mRNA, mRNA, combine it with ribosomes and lay down the right amino acids, then we form a protein during the process of translation. 
all of this, these processes, that is, transcription and translation, are part of your central dogma. And so by the binding of our, I'm sorry, yes, by the binding of our hormone to a receptor on the inside of our cell, we ultimately can trigger protein synthesis inside of our cell. And as long as this complex stays bound, this transcription can potentially continue to occur. The, the other mechanism that hormones depend on to alter the metabolism of the cell is called a second messenger system. And remember I said some neurotransmitters depend on this mechanism as well. Uh, you learned primarily how, for instance, acetylcholine binds to the postsynaptic membrane and immediately opens ion channels. Well, sometimes the mechanism is not quite so direct, and then we call this a second messenger system. So some neurotransmitters and many hormones depend on this mechanism. In this mechanism, we see that the receptor is actually bound to the surface of our cell membrane, which is kind of what I've led you to believe for the most, most of my discussions until I just explained to you earlier in the previous slide, direct gene activation, where a receptor is also present on the inside of a cell. So this is a, a mechanism designed for water-soluble hormones, meaning those that are amino acid-based. They cannot cross the cell membrane. Now there are a number of second messenger systems, some better understood than others, and the most common and the most well understood is called the cyclic AMP or CAMP um, second messenger system, with AMP standing for adenosine monophosphate. There's also one called PIP calcium and many others. We're going to just focus on the cyclic AMP second messenger system. So here again, we're looking at a cell with its nucleus, except that this time, this cell has a surface receptor for its um, hormones. Here we have a capillary with blood in it and we're focusing on water-soluble hormones, such as amino acid-based hormones. This water-soluble hormone leaves the bloodstream, finds its receptor, and binds. So Now, when this complex is formed between the surface receptor of the cell and the hormone, we see that a G protein, which sits right by this complex between the hormone and its receptor, this G protein becomes activated and it actually migrates a short distance on the inside of the cell membrane to ultimately run into its substrate, which is called adenyl cyclase. It's basically an enzyme that now becomes activated. That activated enzyme can convert adenosine triphosphate into cyclic adenosine monophosphate. This is what we consider our second messenger. So if we add a few notes here, this is our second messenger, and our hormone is our first messenger. So once we have our second messenger, called cyclic AMP, it can now activate protein kinases. Protein kinases are enzymes that, when they are activated, can allow for the transfer of a phosphate group, which they grab from an adenosine triphosphate, and allow for that phosphate to bind to um, proteins in the cytoplasm. We talk about the phosphorylation of proteins. And when this happens, it activates... Uh, these proteins such that they can go through a variety of cellular processes. Now this figure here only illustrates activation of um, intracellular pathways, but as I try to stress here, we also have pathways that are just like this that depend on the common second messenger system, including 
the cyclic AMP second messenger system that would allow for inhibition. In other words, that would stop and prevent the um, phosphorylation, phosphorylation of proteins, preventing um, further cellular activity. What's special about second messenger systems, such as the cyclic AMP or the PIP calcium or the other ones that are out there, is that they really amplify the cellular activity in response to the binding of maybe just one hormone. In other words, so let's say one hormone binds to a single, re single receptor and that causes the activation of actually many G proteins, right? So when I explained it to you, it sounded like there was just one G pro protein, but in reality, one hormone can trigger the activation of many G proteins. And these many G proteins are going to then activate, obviously, many adenylocyclase molecules, and that leads to the formation of many, many cyclic AMP molecules, our second messenger. And when we have many of those, they in turn can activate all these kinase enzymes that can then phosphorylate many, many, many um, proteins. And remember, once we have some enzymes, they can be used over and over and over again such that many, many proteins can become phosphorylated, which then leads to all kinds of cellular, intracellular responses. So again, because the effect of one hormone is so amplified as the signaling pathway continues, this then allows for an increased efficiency, an increase in the speed, and also a better specificity of our response to the hormone. Now, second messenger systems such as cyclic AMP can be pretty short-lived because the cyclic AMP, our second, messengers, second, second messenger in this mechanism, is quickly taken apart by an enzyme uh, or with the help of an enzyme called PDE, or phosphodiesterase, which is floating around in the cytoplasm. So there are many examples of hormones that depend on this mechanism. The ones that you are definitely already familiar with are epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, they very much depend on the cyclic AMP second messenger system.